let's go through some fairly serious bleeding disorders and the ways you can differentiate them and diagnose them on your shelf. Uh, so first thing, we'll start with some different presentations of the first disease we're going to talk about. So you have somebody coming in who's elderly, but you know they come in with this abdominal pain and the exam may lead you to think that you're dealing with some kind of irritable bowel syndrome or maybe any, you know, they're going to lead you in a GI direction. You notice they have a fever, so you think maybe they've got a, some kind of a diarrheal illness maybe, but they just tell you abdominal pain, no diarrhea, and then further evaluation, they tell you that there is this non-specific abdominal exam, and then you learn that there's thrombocytopenia. And the thrombocytopenia, for GI purposes, doesn't really go along with the abdominal pain, at least not from an obvious standpoint. And then you do more uh, evaluation and they have a normal uh, PT, PTT, suggest so a normal coagulation function and normal electrolytes. So you've got this sort of vague fever, abdominal pain picture here with low platelet count. Then another presentation for this same disorder could be somebody coming in with worsening fatigue and bruising and it sounds almost like a leukemia picture. And then you get their blood work back and their their blood counts are normal other than they have a really low platelet count or thrombocytopenia, suggesting that this is not a malignancy. So again, vague thrombocytopenia and somebody that really doesn't have a whole lot of symptoms. And then lastly, you could have somebody with a more obvious presentation that has an acute alteration of mental status or an acute stroke with abdominal pain lots of bruising and it all started a day or two ago you notice that they're jaundiced and their you know blood counts are normal again except for the fact that they have a super low platelet count this patient again here can also have increased creatinine suggesting renal insufficiency and then bang you have an evidence of a stroke right there so this type of vignette might try and sway you off into thinking oh yeah this is a neurologic stroke and that's what I should be focusing on but all three of these presentations, very different and all very vague, can all represent thrombocytopenic or thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. And remember that's due to on the shelf probably more of an acquired development of an Adams TS13 antibody that results in a reduced function of that enzyme. And when that enzyme doesn't work, your platelets basically continue to be activated and they form platelet exclusive platelet-rich thrombi all throughout the body, and the consumption of the platelets forming these thrombi leads to severe thrombocytopenia. And usually the people that get this are older, but they don't necessarily have a pre-existing reason to get it. So it's someone who maybe was previously healthy, now they come in and they have evidence for a hemolytic anemia and schistocytes, and they've got this isolated thrombocytopenia. And then, uh, again, you just got, there's so many variations to how this can present to you on the shelf. And anybody who has thrombocytopenia and has anything else with it, like a fever or an increased creatinine or acute confusion, should lead you to suspect this diagnosis. However, if you're lucky enough to be given the whole pentad of symptoms, maybe in a two paragraph long description, then that's a case where they may want you to tell them more about how to treat it or management questions, but the pentad again would be isolated thrombocytopenia with fever and renal failure, and they have a hemolytic anemia because the platelet thrombi cause schistocyte formation, they break up the red blood cells, and then they can have acute neurologic abnormalities like stroke due to thrombi formation, or they could have acute confusion. And just remember the mechanism of the schistocyte formation here is the platelet-rich thrombi. And remember that it's just platelets with thrombo uh, TTP. So we'll go over the symptoms really quickly, and it can range from anything from mucosal bleeding, signs of low platelets like petechiae, gum bleeding, or oozing. But these patients are going to lack venous or arterial thrombosis. And anybody who has a large vessel thrombosis, uh, that's someone that should lead you to think that this is not TTP because TTP should not involve fibrin or real uh, large vessel thrombosis.
And then for whatever reason, these people get GI complaints, which can range from mild abdominal pain to nausea, vomiting, and it can all be very nonspecific, or they could even have GI bleeding because they, they don't have functioning platelets. So, you know, it's going to be hard to not see this as an exclusively GI vignette if they present it to you with GI symptoms, at least from the onset. And stroke, like I've already gone over, is a common severe complication of this. And then the kidney dysfunction due to the thrombi formation. And they're going to have a normocytic anemia because they are lysing the red blood cells on the platelet thrombi. And clues to this would be scleral icterus. And again, they're going to have an increased LDH, and a decreased haptoglobin, and an increased indirect bilirubin, all suggestive of a hemolytic anemia. And then I wanted to make sure that you are aware of an alternative diagnosis that is usually used to try and trick people. And I feel like I get tricked with this every time I get this question, is you like to diagnose somebody with immune thrombocytopenic purpura if all you see in the vignette is low platelets. Um, but remember that if you have ITP, all you should have is low platelets. There should not be a fever. There should not be uh, any associated renal dysfunction or abdominal pain. And anybody who's got more than isolated thrombocytopenia, uh, you need to start thinking about TTP or a more severe cause for the bleeding. And then with leukemia, you should have more of an you know, infiltrative bone marrow response with anemia and thrombocytopenia together, not necessarily with a hemolytic anemia. And if you had leukemia, you would expect to see an increase in one of the different function uh, fractions of the white blood cells. And again, these people should have a normal white blood cell count, effectively ruling out a leukemia. So this is probably what's most important for you to get down here, um, uh, the diagnosis and treatment of this disorder. And I think that counterintuitively, we would like to measure the Adams TS enzyme activity. However, it takes days for that to come back and confirm the diagnosis. So you can't just order that and tell the patient, oh, we're going to figure it out later because this is a fairly severe disorder and people are at risk for complications and even death. So while you're waiting for this to come back, you need to start treatment. And you can start treatment based on a clinical diagnosis with somebody who has this isolated thrombocytopenia and evidence for a hemolytic anemia, ideally with schistocytes seen on a peripheral smear. And then, like I told you already, the lab results should come back with increased bilirubin, maybe some jaundice, increased LDH from the lysis of the blood cells, and then negative Coombs testing, which rules out an autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And then equally and probably something you should definitely make note of and keep in your brain is that these people have a normal PT and PTT level because they're not affecting the coagulation system. They should also have normal fibrinogen levels. So the treatment that you must know, get in your brain, that you should start as soon as you have a clinical diagnosis is plasma exchange and glucocorticoids, IV steroids. And another common management question is when you have a suspicion for this diagnosis based on the thrombocytopenia and maybe a normocytic anemia with signs of hemolytic anemia, you may be asked to say, what should you do now? And the answer might be to do a peripheral smear of the blood. So I'll leave the summary for there if you need to go over that more. And then quickly we'll run through ITP. And this should have a characteristic history, usually a young woman, middle-aged woman who had a preceding sort of viral infection. And this is due to an acquired antibody against platelets leading to their destruction. And uh, the symptoms can be mild or, you know, they should be mild in the question with subtle gum bleeding or petechiae. Uh, they should only come to your clinical attention uh, based on these subtle symptoms. If they have more than that, you should be thinking about something more severe. And that's what I said there. And so how do we choose to either observe them or give them to steroids? And the answer is, if they're having symptomatic bleeding and their platelets are greater than 30, uh, excuse me, if they're not symptomatic and their platelets are greater than 30, we don't do anything. We leave them alone. And... I've, saw, I've seen different numbers for the platelet count, uh, but 30,000 is the number that seemed most reasonable to me. I believe that was the one that was in UWorld. Um, but if they're asymptomatic in general on the shelf, I think you can just observe them. Then if they are having bleeding symptoms, then you probably should give them steroids. 
and if their platelet count is less than 30, that would also be a reason to give them steroids. And remember, you do not transfuse platelets for ITP because it's a consumptive process. Giving more platelets is just going to give the antibodies more platelets to chew up, and it's not going to help the underlying problem. So steroids will be the treatment of choice for somebody who has bleeding and platelets under 30. So DIC, this is extremely important, and I think that when you think about DIC, you shouldn't think of this as an isolated clinical diagnosis, but rather you should think about it as uh, an extreme on a spectrum with coagulation abnormality. Sort of like when you think about the Frank Starling curve for hemodynamic balance in a heart failure patient, think about DIC as being way off the Frank Starling curve for these people with coagulation. So essentially, something causes the coagulation system to be activated, and it's usually some kind of tissue factor or LPS, which is from gram-negative bacteria, or cancers can release a procoagulant protein that acts like a tissue factor, but classically here, it's some kind of tissue factor, so trauma or anything that's breaking up the blood vessels and exposing, exposing underlying tissue factor is going to activate the coagulation system, and when that's activated, you're going to form thrombi, and then once thrombi form, the body's going to try and break them down with plasminogen, leading to fibrinolysis and increased fibrin degradation products, and as it turns out, when you start increasing the levels of these fibrin degradation products, you actually cause further dysfunction of the system, sort of in a positive feedback loop, worsening the overall clinical syndrome. And then ultimately, these people form thrombi that can occlude distal organs, leading to infarction, and they can also form venous and arterial thromboses. Um, and they also can develop severe bleeding because in the midst of all this, they've used up all their coagulation factors and their platelets, and as you remember, it takes days to produce those, so they're outpacing the production, which worsens the bleeding. And be aware of the underlying causes, and it should be relatively straightforward if they had a trauma or they appear septic. Meningococcemia, again, is another one, and actually it is associated with um, somehow releasing actual tissue factor. I can't remember the actual mechanism. And then transfusion reactions are another common cause you should keep in mind. Um, and so in comparison with TTP, or hemolytic uremic syndrome, these are fibrin and platelet-rich thrombi, which is why you see actual thromboses of the arteries and veins. In comparison with TTP, where you're not seeing arterial or venous thrombi, and it's platelet-exclusive thrombi, no thrombi. And then, of course, we do see schistocytes here because, because of the fibrin platelet clots. Same mechanism as in TTP. You're just breaking up the red blood cells, and you'll have the same abnormalities on your labs. How can we tell that we're dealing with this based on the presentation? Anybody who's critically ill, who's bleeding at all, I would start to suspect this diagnosis, especially if they look like they're going into shock. And the classic one is oozing from the IV sites. And you may also just be told that somebody had surgery or had trauma and they're still bleeding from their wound or their trauma site. Um, and uh, when you get the question, they're usually going to tell you that there's thrombocytopenia and tell you that there's schistocytes or hemolytic anemia. And then from there, you're going to have to start using your diagnostic skills to figure out if this is DIC or TTP or something else. And the way to do that is if the PT and PTT are prolonged and you have a low fibrinogen with increased fiber degradation products based on a D-dimer, that all suggests that you have DIC with increased um, uh, usage of coagulation factors leading to a bleeding problem and prolongation of those clotting times, using up the fibrinogen, uh, forming those clots, and then breaking down the clots with the D-dimer split products. All that together should give you a confirmed diagnosis of DIC in the question. And then uh, you could also I don't know if they'd ever ask you to measure the absolute decrease in coagulation factors as one of the answer choices, but be aware that that is a thing in increased thrombin time as well, which goes along with the PT and PTT times. And then other signs that you may be dealing with this are, again, shock or increased liver enzymes, creatinine levels, all things that suggest end organ dysfunction due to these platelet fibrin-rich thrombi occluding blood vessels. So, you know, we talked about how to diagnosis and and treatment is really going to be just fixing the underlying cause. And I think that that's where they can get you is that you don't do plasma exchange, plasma phoresis, you don't do steroids. You need to address the sepsis, cancer, whatever's causing them to be in DIC is what you need to correct. And until you do that, it's not going to get better.
And I threw in here a couple of examples of diagnoses that can masquerade as DIC that you need to rule out. And noteworthy here is heparin-induced thrombocytopenia that I talked about in a different lecture. And the, the question, you know, the thing here is that you're going to have a low platelet count and evidence for thrombosis, but these people should have a normal PT level because heparin would not affect the PT level. And then they should have normal fibrinogen levels because it's not a consumptive process in that regard. But they will have enough symptoms to make this confusing with DIC. But again, heparin-induced thrombocytopenic patients should not be acutely in shock or that ill either. And you should have a characteristic history with recent exposure to heparin. And then we've already talked about TTP and again, no arterial or venous thrombosis. But that can be kind of confusing too because they do get stroke and signs of acute confusion that can make you think that they're having an acute ischemic event. And I think that platelet-rich thrombi can probably do that in small enough vessels in there. I can't completely justify that to you, but large vessel thromboses to the liver or the kidney should lead you more towards thinking about DIC. And a special case that I wanted to cover uh, at the end here is you have a younger person who's got symptoms that maybe suggest that they uh, have been dealing with cancer, like night sweats or fatigue, so you're thinking about some kind of leukemia. Then they come to the ER with shock, and they've got lots of bruising, they're bleeding, and they've got splenomegaly, and you do labs, and everything's low. Pancytopenia, but they've got increased clotting factor times, and this is actually a presentation for acute promyelocytic anemia. And I gave multiple choice here. Uh, so what should we start for this person if they have acute promyelocytic anemia? And the answer to that would be all transretinoic acid. So you start the all transretinoic acid and that can help to sort of reverse the underlying condition here, which is again, what you want to do with anybody who has DIC. But I think what I really wanted to point out to you is that people with acute promyelocytic anemia have, they're noteworthy for presenting with DIC when they come to clinical attention. And that's something you should be aware of as it is a common shelf question. Okay. Uh, and I just summarize that here for you again. And also I'd recommend knowing that all transretinoic acid is part of the treatment regimen for this cancer. And the last thing I wanted to throw out to you is that if you have evidence for schistocytes in a patient and there's some mention of previous heart history, like a valve replacement, it could be an aortic valve or a mitral valve replacement, and they've got evidence for increased LDH, low haptoglobin, and, but not necessarily markedly abnormal values or more of, a, more of a subtle hemolytic anemia, this would suggest to you that there's turbulent flow from the mechanical valve causing schistocyte formation and hemolytic anemia. So... Be aware of that as a cause and don't choose a more severe answer like TTP for somebody who maybe just has a metal heart valve breaking up the red blood cells.